This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by R. Francis Smith, Sturgeon's Law, www.sturgeonslaw.com. Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas. Chapter 15. Number 34 and Number 27. Dante passed through all the stages of torture natural to prisoners in suspense. He was sustained at first by that pride of conscious innocence which is the sequence to hope. Then he began to doubt his own innocence, which justified in some measure the governor's belief in his mental alienation. And then, relaxing his sentiment of pride, he addressed his supplications not to God, but to man. God is always the last resource. Unfortunates, who ought to begin with God, do not have any hope in him till they have exhausted all other means of deliverance. Dante asked to be removed from his present dungeon into another, for a change, however disadvantageous, was still a change, and would afford him some amusement. He entreated to be allowed to walk about, to have fresh air, books, and writing materials. His requests were not granted, but he went on asking all the same. He accustomed himself to speaking to the new jailer, although the latter was, if possible, more taciturn than the old one. But still, to speak to a man, even though mute, was something. Dante spoke for the sake of hearing his own voice. He had tried to speak when alone, but the sound of his voice terrified him. Often before his captivity, Dante's mind had revolted at the idea of assemblages of prisoners made up of thieves, vagabonds, and murderers. He now wished to be amongst them, in order to see some other face besides that of his jailer. He sighed for the galleys with the infamous costume, the chain, and the brand on the shoulder. The galley slaves breathed the fresh air of heaven and saw each other. They were very happy. He besought the jailer one day to let him have a companion, were it even the mad abbey. The jailer, though rough and hardened by the constant sight of so much suffering, was yet a man. At the bottom of his heart he had often had a feeling of pity for this unhappy young man who suffered so, and he laid the request of number thirty-four before the governor. But the latter sapiently imagined that Dante wished to conspire or attempt an escape, and refused his request. Dante had exhausted all human resources, and he then turned to God. All the pious ideas that had been so long forgotten returned. He recollected the prayers his mother had taught him, and discovered a new meaning in every word. For in prosperity prayers seem but a mere medley of words, until misfortune comes, and the unhappy sufferer first understands the meaning of the sublime language in which he invokes the pity of heaven. He prayed and prayed aloud, no longer terrified at the sound of his own voice, for he fell into a sort of ecstasy. He laid every action of his life before the Almighty, proposed tasks to accomplish, and at the end of every prayer introduced the entreaty oftener addressed to man than to God, Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. Yet, in spite of his earnest prayers, Dante remained a prisoner. Then gloom settled heavily upon him. Dante was a man of great simplicity of thought, and without education. He could not, therefore, in the solitude of his dungeon, traverse in mental vision the history of the ages, bring to life the nations that had perished, and rebuild the ancient cities so vast and stupendous in the light of the imagination, and that pass before the eye glowing with celestial colors in Martin's Babylonian pictures. He could not do this. He, whose past life was so short, whose present so melancholy, and his future so doubtful. Nineteen years of light to reflect upon in eternal darkness. No distraction could come to his aid. His energetic spirit, that would have exulted in thus revisiting the past, was imprisoned like an eagle in a cage. He clung to one idea, that of his happiness destroyed without apparent cause by an unheard-of fatality. He considered and reconsidered this idea, devoured it, so to speak, as the implacable Ugolino devours the skull of Archbishop Roger in the Inferno of Dante. 
rage supplanted religious fervor. Dante uttered blasphemies that made his jailer recoil with horror, dashed himself furiously against the walls of his prison, wreaked his anger upon everything, and chiefly upon himself, so that the least thing, a grain of sand, a straw, or a breath of air that annoyed him, led to paroxysms of fury. Then the letter that Villefort had showed to him recurred to his mind, and every line gleamed forth in fiery letters on the wall like the many tekel ufarsen of Belshazzar. He told himself that it was the enmity of man, and not the vengeance of heaven, that had thus plunged him into the deepest misery. He consigned his unknown persecutors to the most horrible tortures he could imagine, and found them all insufficient, because after torture came death and after death, if not repose, at least the boon of unconsciousness. By dint of constantly dwelling on the idea that tranquillity was death, and if punishment were the end in view, other tortures than death must be invented, he began to reflect on suicide. Unhappy he who, on the brink of misfortune, broods over ideas like these. Before him is a dead sea that stretches in azure calm before the eye. But he who unwarily ventures within its embrace finds himself struggling with a monster that would drag him down to perdition. Once thus ensnared, unless the protecting hand of God snatch him thence, all is over, and his struggles but tend to hasten his destruction. This state of mental anguish is, however, less terrible than the sufferings that proceed or the punishment that possibly will follow. There is a sort of consolation at the contemplation of the yawning abyss, at the bottom of which lie darkness and obscurity. Edmund found some solace in these ideas. All his sorrows, all his sufferings, with their train of gloomy specters, fled from his cell when the angel of death seemed about to enter. Dante reviewed his past life with composure, and, looking forward with terror to his future existence, chose that middle line that seemed to afford him a refuge. Sometimes, said he, in my voyages, when I was a man and commanded other men, I have seen the heavens overcast, the sea rage and foam, the storm arise, and like a monstrous bird beating the two horizons with its wings. Then I felt that my vessel was a vain refuge that trembled and shook before the tempest. Soon the fury of the waves and the sight of the sharp rocks announced the approach of death, and death then terrified me, and I used all my skill and intelligence as a man and a sailor to struggle against the wrath of God. But I did so because I was happy, because I had not courted death, because to be cast upon a bed of rocks and seaweed seemed terrible, because I was unwilling that I, a creature made for the service of God, should serve for food to the gulls and ravens. But now it is different. I have lost all that bound me to life. Death smiles and invites me to repose. I die after my own manner. I die exhausted and broken-spirited, as I fall asleep when I have paced three thousand times round my cell. No sooner had this idea taken possession of him than he became more composed, arranged his couch to the best of his power, ate little and slept less, and found existence almost supportable, because he felt that he could throw it off at pleasure like a worn-out garment. Two methods of self-destruction were at his disposal. He could hang himself with his handkerchief to the window bars, or refuse food and die of starvation. But the first was repugnant to him. Dante has always entertained the greatest horror of pirates who are hung up to the yard-arm. He would not die by what seemed an infamous death. He resolved to adopt the second, and began that day to carry out his resolve. Nearly four years had passed away. At the end of the second he had ceased to mark the lapse of time. Dante said, I wish to die, and had chosen the manner of his death and fearful of changing his mind, he had taken an oath to die. When my morning and evening meals are brought, thought he, I will cast them out of the window, and they will think that I have eaten them. He kept his word. Twice a day he cast out, through the barred aperture, the provisions his jailer brought him, at first gaily, then with deliberation, and at last with regret. Nothing but the recollection of his oath gave him strength to proceed. 
Hunger made viands once repugnant, now acceptable. He held the plate in his hand for an hour at a time, and gazed thoughtfully at the morsel of bad meat, of tainted fish, of black and moldy bread. It was the last yearning for life, contending with the resolution of despair. Then his dungeon seemed less somber, his prospects less desperate. He was still young. He was only four or five and twenty. He had nearly fifty years to live. What unforeseen events might not open his prison door and restore him to liberty? Then he raised to his lips the repast that, like a voluntary tantalus, he refused himself. But he thought of his oath, and he would not break it. He persisted until, at last, he had not sufficient strength to rise and cast his supper out of the loophole. The next morning he could not see or hear. The jailer feared he was dangerously ill. Edmund hoped he was dying. Thus the day passed away. Edmund felt a sort of stupor creeping over him, which brought with it a feeling almost of content. The gnawing pain at his stomach had ceased. His thirst had abated. When he closed his eyes he saw myriads of lights dancing before them like the will-o'-the-wisps that play about the marshes. It was the twilight of that mysterious country called death. Suddenly, about nine o'clock in the evening, Edmund heard a hollow sound in the wall against which he was lying. So many loathsome animals inhabited the prison that their noise did not, in general, awake him. But whether abstinence had quickened his faculties, or whether the noise was really louder than usual, Edmund raised his head and listened. It was a continual scratching, as if made by a huge claw, a powerful tooth, or some iron instrument attacking the stones. Although weakened, the young man's brain instantly responded to the idea that haunts all prisoners, liberty. It seemed to him that heaven had at length taken pity on him, and had sent this noise to warn him on the very brink of the abyss. Perhaps one of those beloved ones he had so often thought of was thinking of him, and striving to diminish the distance that separated them. No, no, doubtless he was deceived, and it was but one of those dreams that forerun death. Edmund still heard the sound. It lasted nearly three hours. He then heard a noise of something falling, and all was silent. Some hours afterwards it began again, nearer and more distinct. Edmund was intensely interested. Suddenly the jailer entered. For a week since he had resolved to die, and during the four days that he had been carrying out his purpose, Edmund had not spoken to the attendant, had not answered him when he inquired what was the matter with him, and turned his face to the wall when he looked too curiously at him. But now the jailer might hear the noise and put an end to it, and so destroy a ray of something like hope that soothed his last moments. The jailer brought him his breakfast. Dante raised himself up, and began to talk about everything, about the bad quality of the food, about the coldness of his dungeon, grumbling and complaining, in order to have an excuse for speaking louder, and wearying the patience of his jailer, who out of kindness of heart had brought broth and white bread for his prisoner. Fortunately, he fancied that Dante was delirious, and placing the food on the rickety table he withdrew. Edmund listened, and the sound became more and more distinct. "'There can be no doubt about it,' thought he. "'It is some prisoner who is striving to obtain his freedom. Oh, if I were only there to help him!' Suddenly another idea took possession of his mind, so used to misfortune that it was scarcely capable of hope. The idea that the noise was made by workmen the governor had ordered to repair the neighboring dungeon. It was easy to ascertain this, but how could he risk the question? It was easy to call his jailer's attention to the noise and watch his countenance as he listened, but might he not by this means destroy hopes far more important than the short-lived satisfaction of his own curiosity? Unfortunately, Edmund's brain was still so feeble that he could not bend his thoughts to anything in particular. He saw but one means of restoring lucidity and clearness to his judgment. He turned his eyes towards the soup which the jailer had brought, rose, staggered towards it, raised the vessel to his lips, and drank off the contents with a feeling of indescribable pleasure. 
He had often heard that shipwrecked persons had died through having eagerly devoured too much food. Edmund replaced on the table the bread he was about to devour and returned to his couch. He did not wish to die. He soon felt that his ideas became again collected. He could think and strengthen his thoughts by reasoning. Then he said to himself, I must put this to the test, but without compromising anybody. If it is a workman, I need but knock against the wall, and he will cease to work, in order to find out who is knocking and why he does so. But as his occupation is sanctioned by the governor, he will soon resume it. If, on the contrary, it is a prisoner, the noise I make will alarm him. He will cease, and not begin again until he thinks every one is asleep. Edmund rose again, but this time his legs did not tremble and his sight was clear. He went to a corner of his dungeon, detached a stone, and with it knocked against the wall where the sound came. He struck thrice. At the first blow the sound ceased, as if by magic. Edmund listened intently. An hour passed, two hours passed, and no sound was heard from the wall. All was silent there. Full of hope, Edmund swallowed a few mouthfuls of bread and water, and, thanks to the vigor of his constitution, found himself well-nigh recovered. The day passed away in utter silence. Night came without recurrence of the noise. "'It is a prisoner,' said Edmund joyfully. The night passed in perfect silence. Edmund did not close his eyes. In the morning the jailer brought him fresh provisions. He had already devoured those of the previous day. He ate these, listening anxiously for the sound, walking round and round his cell, shaking the iron bars of the loophole, restoring vigor and agility to his limbs by exercise, and so preparing himself for his future destiny. At intervals he listened to learn if the noise had not begun again, and grew impatient at the prudence of the prisoner, who did not guess he had been disturbed by a captive as anxious for liberty as himself. Three days passed, seventy-two long, tedious hours, which he counted off by minutes. At length, one evening, as the jailer was visiting him for the last time that night, Dante, with his ear for the hundredth time at the wall, fancied he heard an almost imperceptible movement among the stones. He moved away, walked up and down his cell to collect his thoughts, and then went back and listened. The matter was no longer doubtful. Something was at work on the other side of the wall. The prisoner had discovered the danger, and had substituted a lever for a chisel. Encouraged by this discovery, Edmund determined to assist the indefatigable laborer. He began by moving his bed, and looked around for anything with which he could pierce the wall, penetrate the moist cement, and displace a stone. He saw nothing. He had no knife or sharp instrument. The window grating was of iron, but he had too often assured himself of its solidity. All his furniture consisted of a bed, a chair, a table, a pail, and a jug. The bed had iron clamps, but they were screwed to the wood, and it would have required a screwdriver to take them off. The table and chair had nothing. The pail had once possessed a handle, but that had been removed. Dante had but one resource, which was to break the jug, and with one of the sharp fragments attack the wall. He let the jug fall on the floor, and it broke in pieces. Dante concealed two or three of the sharpest fragments in his bed, leaving the rest on the floor. The breaking of his jug was too natural an accident to excite suspicion. Edmund had all the night to work in, but in the darkness he could not do much, and he soon felt that he was working against something very hard. He pushed back his bed and waited for day. All night he heard the subterranean workmen, who continued to mine his way. Day came. The jailer entered. Dante told him that the jug had fallen from his hands while he was drinking, and the jailer went grumblingly to fetch another, without giving himself the trouble to remove the fragments of the broken one. He returned speedily, advised the prisoner to be more careful, and departed. Dante heard joyfully the key grate in the lock. He listened until the sound of steps died away, and then, hastily displacing his bed, saw by the faint light that penetrated into his cell that he had labored uselessly the previous evening in attacking the stone instead of removing the plaster that surrounded it. 
The damp had rendered it friable, and Dante was able to break it off, in small morsels, it is true, but at the end of half an hour he had scraped off a handful. A mathematician might have calculated that in two years, supposing that the rock was not encountered, a passage twenty feet long and two feet broad might be formed. The prisoner reproached himself with not having thus employed the hours he had passed in vain hopes, prayer, and despondency. During the six years that he had been imprisoned, what might he not have accomplished? In three days he had succeeded, with the utmost precaution, in removing the cement and exposing the stonework. The wall was built of rough stones, among which, to give strength to the structure, blocks of hewn stone were at intervals embedded. It was one of these he had uncovered, and which he must remove from its socket. Dante strove to do this with his nails, but they were too weak. The fragments of the jug broke, and after an hour of useless toil he paused. Was he to be thus stopped at the beginning, and was he to wait inactive until his fellow workmen had completed his task? Suddenly an idea occurred to him. He smiled, and the perspiration dried on his forehead. The jailer always brought Dante's soup in an iron saucepan. This saucepan contained soup for both prisoners, for Dante had noticed that it was either quite full or half empty, according as the turnkey gave it to him or to his companion first. The handle of the saucepan was of iron. Dante would have given ten years of his life in exchange for it. The jailer was accustomed to pour the contents of the saucepan into Dante's plate, and Dante, after eating his soup with a wooden spoon, washed the plate, which thus served for every day. Now, when evening came, Dante put his plate on the ground near the door. The jailer, as he entered, stepped on it and broke it. This time he could not blame Dante. He was wrong to leave it there, but the jailer was wrong not to have looked before him. The jailer, therefore, only grumbled. Then he looked about for something to pour the soup into. Dante's entire dinner service consisted of one plate. There was no alternative. "'Leave the saucepan,' said Dante. "'You can take it away when you bring me my breakfast.' This advice was to the jailer's taste, as it spared him the necessity of making another trip. He left the saucepan. Dante was beside himself with joy. He rapidly devoured his food, and after waiting an hour, lest the jailer should change his mind in return, he removed his bed, took the handle of the saucepan, inserted the point between the hewn stone and rough stones of the wall, and employed it as a lever. A slight oscillation showed Dante that all went well. At the end of an hour the stone was extricated from the wall, leaving a cavity a foot and a half in diameter. Dante carefully collected the plaster, carried it into the corner of his cell, and covered it with earth. Then, wishing to make the best use of his time while he had the means of labor, he continued to work without ceasing. At the dawn of day he replaced the stone, pushed his bed against the wall, and lay down. The breakfast consisted of a piece of bread. The jailer entered and placed the bread on the table. "'Well, don't you intend to bring me another plate?' said Dante. No, replied the turnkey, you destroy everything. First you break your jug, then you make me break your plate. If all the prisoners followed your example, the government would be ruined. I shall leave you the saucepan and pour your soup into that. So for the future, I hope you will not be so destructive. Dante raised his eyes to heaven and clasped his hands beneath the coverlet. He felt more gratitude for the possession of this piece of iron than he had ever felt for anything. He had noticed, however, that the prisoner on the other side had ceased to labor. No matter. This was a greater reason for proceeding. If his neighbor would not come to him, he would go to his neighbor. All day he toiled on untiringly, and by the evening he had succeeded in extracting ten handfuls of plaster and fragments of stone. When the hour for his jailer's visit arrived, Dante straightened the handle of the saucepan as well as he could, and placed it in its accustomed place. The turnkey poured his ration of soup into it, together with the fish, for thrice a week the prisoners were deprived of meat. This would have been a method of reckoning time, had not Dante long ceased to do so. Having poured out the soup, the turnkey retired. Dante wished to ascertain whether his neighbor had really ceased to work. He listened. All was silent, as it had been for the last three days. 
Dante sighed. It was evident that his neighbor distrusted him. However, he toiled on all the night without being discouraged, but after two or three hours he encountered an obstacle. The iron made no impression, but met with a smooth surface. Dante touched it, and found that it was a beam. This beam crossed, or rather blocked up, the hole Dante has made. It was necessary, therefore, to dig above or under it. The unhappy young man had not thought of this. "'Oh, my God, my God!' murmured he. "'I have so earnestly prayed to you that I hoped my prayers had been heard. After having deprived me of my liberty, after having deprived me of death, after having recalled me to existence, my God, have pity on me, and do not let me die in despair.' "'Who talks of God and despair at the same time?' said a voice that seemed to come from beneath the earth, and deadened by the distance, sounded hollow and sepulchral in the young man's ears. Edmund's hair stood on end, and he rose to his knees. "'Ah!' said he, "'I hear a human voice.' Edmund had not heard any one speak save his jailer for four or five years, and a jailer is no man to a prisoner. He is a living door, a barrier of flesh and blood, adding strength to restraints of oak and iron. "'In the name of heaven!' cried Dante. "'Speak again, though the sound of your voice terrifies me. Who are you?' "'Who are you?' said the voice. "'An unhappy prisoner,' replied Dante, who made no hesitation in answering. "'Of what country?' "'A Frenchman.' "'Your name?' "'Edmund Dante.' "'Your profession?' A sailor. How long have you been here? Since the 28th of February, 1815. Your crime? I am innocent. But of what are you accused? Of having conspired to aid the Emperor's return. What? For the Emperor's return. The Emperor is no longer on the throne, then? He abdicated at Fontainebleau in 1814, and was sent to the island of Elba. But how long have you been here that you are ignorant of all this? Since 1811. Dante shuddered. This man had been four years longer than himself in prison. Do not dig any more, said the voice. Only tell me, how high up is your excavation? On a level with the floor. How is it concealed? Behind my bed. Has your bed been moved since you have been a prisoner? No. What does your chamber open on? A corridor. And the corridor? On a court. Alas, murmured the voice. Oh, what is the matter? cried Dante. I have made a mistake owing to an error in my plans. I took the wrong angle, and have come out fifteen feet from where I intended. I took the wall you are mining for the outer wall of the fortress. But then you would be close to the sea. That is what I hoped. And supposing you had succeeded? I should have thrown myself into the sea, gained one of the islands near here, the Isle de Dom or the Isle de Tipulin, and then I should have been safe. Could you have swum so far? Heaven would have given me strength, but now all is lost. All? Yes. Stop up your excavation carefully. Do not work any more, and wait until you hear from me. Tell me at least who you are. I am... I am number twenty-seven. "'You mistrust me, then,' said Dante. Edmund fancied he heard a bitter laugh resounding from the depths. "'Oh, I am a Christian!' cried Dante, guessing instinctively that this man meant to abandon him. "'I swear to you by him who died for us that naught shall induce me to breathe one syllable to my jailers. But I conjure you, do not abandon me. If you do, I swear to you, for I have got to the end of my strength, that I will dash my brains out against the wall, and you will have my death to reproach yourself with.' How old are you? Your voice is that of a young man. I do not know my age, for I have not counted the years I have been here. All I do know is that I was just nineteen when I was arrested, the 28th of February, 1815. Not quite twenty-six, murmured the voice. At that age he cannot be a traitor. Oh, no, no, cried Dante. I swear to you again, rather than betray you, I would allow myself to be hacked in pieces. You have done well to speak to me, and ask for my assistance, for I was about to form another plan and leave you, but your age reassures me. I will not forget you. Wait. How long? I must calculate our chances. I will give you the signal. 
but you will not leave me. You will come to me, or you will let me come to you. We will escape, and if we cannot escape, we will talk. You of those whom you love, and I of those whom I love. You must love somebody. No, I am alone in the world. Then you will love me. If you are young, I will be your comrade. If you are old, I will be your son. I have a father who is seventy if he yet lives. I only love him and a young girl called Mercedes. My father has not yet forgotten me, I am sure, but God alone knows if she loves me still. I shall love you as I loved my father. It is well, returned the voice, to-morrow. These few words were uttered with an accent that left no doubt of his sincerity. Dante rose, dispersed the fragments with the same precaution as before, and pushed his bed back against the wall. He then gave himself up to his happiness. He would no longer be alone. He was, perhaps, about to regain his liberty. At the worst, he would have a companion, and captivity that is shared is but half captivity. Plaints made in common are almost prayers, and prayers where two or three are gathered together invoke the mercy of heaven. All day Dante walked up and down his cell. He sat down occasionally on his bed, pressing his hand on his heart. At the slightest noise he bounded towards the door. Once or twice the thought crossed his mind that he might be separated from this unknown, whom he loved already, and then his mind was made up. When the jailer moved his bed and stooped to examine the opening, he would kill him with his water jug. He would be condemned to die, but he was about to die of grief and despair when this miraculous noise recalled him to life. The jailer came in the evening. Dante was on his bed. It seemed to him that thus he better guarded the unfinished opening. Doubtless there was a strange expression in his eyes, for the jailer said, "'Come, are you going mad again?' Dante did not answer. He feared that the emotion of his voice would betray him. The jailer went away, shaking his head. Night came. Dante hoped that his neighbor would profit by the silence to address him, but he was mistaken. The next morning, however, just as he removed his bed from the wall, he heard three knocks. He threw himself on his knees. "'Is it you?' said he. "'I am here.' "'Is your jailer gone?' "'Yes,' said Dante. "'He will not return until the evening, so that we have twelve hours before us.' "'I can work, then,' said the voice. "'Oh, yes, yes, this instant I entreat you.' In a moment that part of the floor on which Dante was resting his two hands, as he knelt with his head in the opening, suddenly gave way. He drew back smartly, while a mass of stones and earth disappeared in a hole that opened beneath the aperture he himself had formed. Then from the bottom of this passage, the depth of which it was impossible to measure, he saw appear, first the head, then the shoulders, and lastly the body of a man who sprang lightly into his cell. End of chapter 15「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lizzie Driver The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexander Dumas Chapter 16 A Learned Italian Seizing in his arms the friend so long and ardently desired, Dantes almost carried him towards the window in order to obtain a better view of his features, by the aid of the imperfect light that struggled through the grating. He was a man of small stature, with hair bleached rather by suffering and sorrow than by age. He had a deep-set, penetrating eye, almost buried beneath the thick grey eyebrow, and a long, and still black, beard reaching down to his breast. His thin face, deeply furrowed by care, and the bold outline of his strongly marked features, betokened a man more accustomed to exercise his mental facilities than his physical strength. Large drops of perspiration were now standing on his brow, while the garments that hung about him were so ragged that one could only guess at the pattern upon which they had originally been fashioned. The stranger might have numbered sixty or sixty-five years, but a certain briskness and appearance of vigour in his movements made it probable that he was aged more from captivity than the course of time. He received the enthusiastic greeting of his young acquaintance with evident pleasure, as though his chilled affections were rekindled and invigorated 
by his contact with one so warm and ardent. He thanked him with grateful cordiality for his kindly welcome, although he must at that moment have been suffering bitterly, to find another dungeon where he had fondly reckoned on discovering a means of regaining his liberty. "'Let us first see,' said he, "'whether it is possible to remove the traces of my entrance here. Our future tranquillity depends upon our jailers being entirely ignorant of it.' Advancing to the opening, he stooped and raised the stone easily in spite of its weight. Then, fitting it into its place, he said, "'You removed this stone very carelessly, but I suppose you had no tools to aid you.' "'Why?' exclaimed Dantes with astonishment. "'Do you possess any?' "'I made myself some, and, with the exception of a file, I have all that are necessary—a chisel, pincers, and lever.' "'Oh, how I should like to see these products of your industry and patience! "'Well, in the first place, here is my chisel.' "'So saying, he displayed a sharp, strong blade, with a handle made of beechwood. "'And with what did you contrive to make that?' inquired Dantes. "'With one of the clamps of my bedstand, and this very tool has sufficed me to hollow out the road by which I came hither, a distance of about fifty feet.' Fifty feet!' responded Dantes, almost terrified. "'Do not speak so loud, young man. Don't speak so loud. It frequently occurs in a state prison like this, that persons are stationed outside the doors of the cells, purposely to overhear the conversation of the prisoners. "'But they believe I am shut up alone here. That makes no difference. "'Are you saying that you dug your way a distance of fifty feet to get here?' "'I do.' "'That is about the distance that separates your chamber from mine. "'Only, unfortunately, I did not curve right, "'for want of the necessary geometric instruments "'to calculate my scale of proportion. "'Instead of taking an ellipse of forty feet, I made it fifty. "'I expected, as I told you, to reach the outer wall, "'pierce through it, and throw myself into the sea. "'I have, however, kept along the corridor on which your chamber opens, "'instead of going beneath it. "'My labour is all in vain.' "'for I find that the corridor looks into a courtyard filled with soldiers.' "'That's true,' said Dantes. "'But the corridor you speak of only bounds one side of my cell. "'There are three others. "'Do you know anything of their situation?' "'This one is built against the solid rock, "'and it would take ten experienced miners, "'duly furnished with the requisite tools, "'as many years to perforate it. "'This adjoins the lower part of the governor's apartments.' and were we to work our way through, we should only get into some lock-up cells, where we must necessarily be recaptured. The fourth and last side of your cell faces on... faces on... Stop a minute. Now where does it face? The wall of which he spoke was the one in which was fixed the loophole by which light was admitted to the chamber. This loophole, which gradually diminished in size as it approached the outside, to an opening through which a child could not have passed, was, for better security, furnished with three iron bars, so as to quiet all apprehensions, even in the mind of the most suspicious jailer, as to the possibility of a prisoner's escape. As the stranger asked the question, he dragged the table beneath the window. "'Climb up,' said he to Dantes. The young man obeyed, mounted on the table, and, divining the wishes of his companion, placed his back securely against the wall, and held out both hands. The stranger, whom as yet Dantes knew only by the number of his cell, sprang up with an agility by no means to be expected in a person of his years, and, light and steady on his feet as a cat or a lizard, climbed from the table to the outstretched hands of Dantes, and from them to his shoulders. Then, bending double, for the ceiling of the dungeon prevented him from holding himself erect, he managed to slip his head between the upper bars of the window, so as to be able to command a perfect view from top to bottom. An instant afterwards he hastily drew back his head, saying, "'I thought so,' and sliding from the shoulders of Dantes as dexterously as he had descended, he nimbly leaped from the table to the ground. "'What was it that you thought?' "'asked the young man anxiously, in his turn descending from the table. 
The elder prisoner pondered the matter. Yes, said he at length, it is so. This side of your chamber looks out upon a kind of open gallery, where patrols are continually passing, and sentries keep watch day and night. Are you quite sure of that? Certain. I saw the soldier's shape and the top of his musket. That made me drew my head in so quickly, for I was frightful he might also see me. Well? inquired Dantes. You perceive, then, the utter impossibility of escaping through your dungeon? Then, pursued the young man eagerly, Then, answered the elder prisoner, the will of God will be done. And as the old man slowly pronounced those words, an air of profound resignation spread itself over his careworn countenance. Dantes gazed on the man who could thus philosophically resign hopes, so long and ardently nourished, with an astonishment mingled with admiration. "'Tell me, I entreat of you, who and what you are,' said he at length. "'Never ever met with so remarkable a person as yourself.' "'Willingly,' answered the stranger, "'if indeed you feel any curiosity respecting one, now, alas, powerless to aid you in any way. "'Say not so. You can counsel and support me by the strength of your own powerful mind.' "'Pray let me know who you really are.' "'The stranger smiled a melancholy smile. "'Then listen,' said he. "'I am the Abbey Farrier, "'and have been imprisoned, as you know, "'in this Chateau d'Ilf since the year 1811, "'previously to which I had been confined for three years "'in the fortress of Fenestrelia. "'In the year 1811 I was transferred to Piedmont in France. "'It was at this period I learned that the destiny which seemed subservient to every wish, formed by Napoleon, had bestowed on him a son, named King of Rome even in his cradle. I was very far then from expecting the change you have just informed me of, namely, that four years afterwards, this colossus of power would be overthrown. Then who reigns in France at this moment? Napoleon the Second? No, Louis the Eighteenth. "'The brother of Louis the Seventeenth? "'How inscrutable are the ways of Providence! "'For what great and mysterious purpose has it pleased Heaven "'to abase the man once so elevated, "'and rise up him who was so abased?' "'Dantes's whole attention was riveted on a man "'who could thus forget his own misfortunes "'while occupying himself with the destinies of others. "'Yes, yes,' continued he, "'twill be the same as it were in England.' after Charles I, Cromwell, after Cromwell, Charles II, and then James II, and then some son-in-law or relation, some prince of orange, a stalled holder, who becomes a king, then new concessions to the people, then a constitution, then liberty. Ah, my friend, said the abbey, turning towards Dantes, and surveying him with the kindling gaze of a prophet, you are young, you will see all this come to pass. "'Probably, if I ever get out of prison.' "'True,' replied Farrier. "'We are prisoners, but I forget this sometimes, "'and there are even moments when my mental vision "'transports me beyond these walls, "'and I fancy myself at liberty. "'But wherefore are you here?' "'Because in 1807 I dreamed of the very plan "'Napoleon tried to realise in 1811. "'Because, like Machiavelli, I desired to alter the political face of Italy, and instead of allowing it to be split up into a quantity of petty principalities, each held by some weak or tyrannical ruler, I sought to form one large, compact, and powerful empire. And lastly, because I fancied I had found my Caesar Borgia in a crowned simpleton, who feigned to enter into my views only to betray me. It was the plan of Alexander the Sixth and Clement the Seventh but it will never succeed now, for they attempted it fruitlessly, and Napoleon was unable to complete his work. Italy seems fated to misfortune, and the old man bowed his head. Dantes could not understand a man risking his life for such matters. Napoleon certainly he knew something of, insomuch as he had seen and spoken with him. But of Clement the Seventh and Alexander the Sixth he knew nothing, "'Are you not?' he asked, 
"'The priest, who, here in the Chateau d'Elf, is generally thought to be ill?' "'Mad, you mean, don't you?' "'I do not like to say so,' answered Dante, smiling. "'Well, then,' resumed Faria, with a bitter smile, "'let me ask your question in full, "'by acknowledging that I am the poor mad prisoner of the Chateau d'Elf, "'for many years permitted to amuse the different visitors "'with what is said to be my insanity.' and, in all probability, I should be promoted to the honour of making sport for the children, if such innocent beings could be found in an abode devoted like this to suffering and despair. Dantes remained for a short time mute and motionless. At length he said, "'Then you abandon all hope of escape?' "'I perceive its utter impossibility, and I consider it impious to attempt that which the Almighty evidently does not approve.' "'Nay, be not discouraged. "'Would it not be expecting too much to hope to succeed at your first attempt? "'Why not try to find an opening in another direction "'from that which has so unfortunately failed?' "'Alas, it shows how little notion you can have of all it has cost me "'to effect a purpose so unexpectedly frustrated "'that you talk of beginning over again. "'In the first place, I was four years making the tools I possess.' "'and have been two years scraping and digging out earth, "'hard as granite itself. "'Then what toil and fatigue has it not been "'to remove huge stones "'I should once have deemed impossible to loosen? "'Whole days have I passed in these titanic efforts, "'considering my labour well repaid, "'if, by night-time, "'I had contrived to carry away a square inch "'of this hard-bound cement, "'changed by ages into a substance "'unyielding as the stones themselves.' Then, to conceal the mass of earth and rubbish I dug up, I was compelled to break through a staircase, and throw the fruits of my labour into the hollow part of it. But this well is now so completely choked up, that I scarcely think it would be possible to add another handful of dust, without leading to discovery. Consider also that I fully believed I had accomplished the end and aim of my undertaking, for which I had so exactly husbanded my strength, as to make it just hold out to the termination of my enterprise. And now, at the moment when I reckoned upon success, my hopes are forever dashed from me. No, I repeat again, that nothing shall induce me to renew attempts evidently at variance with the Almighty's pleasure. Dantes held down his head, that the other might not see how joy at the thought of having a companion outweighed the sympathy he felt for the failure of the Abbey's plans. The Abbey sank upon Edmund's bed, while Edmund himself remained standing. "'Escape had never once occurred to him. "'There are indeed some things which appear so impossible "'that the mind does not dwell on them for an instant. "'To undermine the ground for fifty feet, "'to devote three years to a labour which, if successful, "'would conduct you to a precipice overhanging the sea, "'to plunge into the waves from the height of fifty, sixty, perhaps a hundred feet, "'at the risk of being dashed to pieces against the rocks.' "'should you have been fortunate enough to have escaped the fire of the sentinels. "'And even, supposing all these perils past, "'then to have to swim for your life at a distance of at least three miles "'ere you could reach the shore, "'with difficulty so startling and formidable "'that Dantes had never even dreamed of such a scheme, "'resigning himself rather to death. "'But the sight of an old man clinging to life with so desperate a courage— "'gave a fresh turn to his ideas, "'and inspired him with new courage. "'Another, older and less strong than he, "'had attempted what he had not had sufficient resolution to undertake, "'and had failed only because of an error in calculation. "'This same person, "'with almost incredible patience and perseverance, "'had contrived to provide himself with tools requisite "'for so unparalleled an attempt.' Another had done all this. Why, then, was it impossible to Dantes? Faria had dug his way through fifty feet. Dantes would dig a hundred. Faria, at the age of fifty, had devoted three years to the task. He, who was but half as old, would sacrifice six. Faria, a priest and savant, had not shrunk from the idea of risking his life by trying to swim a distance of three miles to one of the islands, Domir, Retoniu, or Limar. 
Should a hardy sailor, an experienced diver, like himself, shrink from a similar task? Should he, who had so often for mere amusement's sake plunged to the bottom of the sea, to fetch up the bright coral branch, hesitate to entertain the same project? He could do it in an hour, and how many times had he, for pure pastime, continued in the water for more than twice as long? At once Dantes resolved to follow the brave example of his energetic companion, and to remember that what has once been done may be done again. After continuing some time in profound meditation, the young man suddenly exclaimed, "'I have found what you are in search of.' Faria started. "'Have you indeed?' cried he, raising his head with quick anxiety. "'Pray let me know what it is you have discovered.' The corridor through which you have bored your way from the cell you occupy here extends in the same direction as the outer gallery, does it not? It does. And is not above fifteen feet from it? About that. Well, then, I will tell you what we must do. We must pierce through the corridor by forming a side opening about the middle, as if it were the top part of a cross. This time you will lay your plans more accurately. "'we shall get out into the gallery you have described, "'kill the sentinels who guards it, and make our escape. "'All we require to ensure success is courage, "'and that you possess, "'and strength which I am not deficient in. "'As for patience, you have abundantly proved yours. "'You shall now see me prove mine.' "'One instant, my dear friend,' replied the Abbey. "'It is clear you do not understand the nature of the courage "'with which I am endowed.' "'and what use I intend making of my strength. "'As for patience, I consider that I have abundantly exercised that "'in beginning every morning the task of the night before, "'and every night renewing the task of the day. "'But then, young man, and I pray of you to give me your full attention, "'then I thought I could not be doing anything displeasing to the Almighty "'in trying to set an innocent being at liberty, "'one who had committed no offence and merited no condemnation.' "'And have your notions changed?' asked Dantes with much surprise. "'Do you think yourself more guilty in making the attempt, since you have encountered me?' "'No, neither do I wish to incur guilt. "'Hitherto I have fancied myself merely waging war against circumstances, not men. "'I have thought it no sin to bore through a wall or destroy a staircase. "'But I cannot so easily persuade myself to pierce a heart or take away a life.' A slight movement of surprise escaped Dantes. "'Is it possible,' said he, "'that where your liberty is at stake "'you can allow any such scruple to deter you from obtaining it?' "'Tell me,' replied Faria, "'what has hindered you from knocking down your jailer "'with a piece of wood torn from your bedstead, "'dressing yourselves in his clothes, "'and endeavouring to escape?' "'Simply the fact that the idea never occurred to me.' "'answered Dantes. "'Because,' said the old man, "'the natural repugnance to the commission of such a crime "'prevented you from thinking of it, "'and so it ever is, because, "'in simple and allowable things, "'our natural instincts keep us from deviating "'from the strict line of duty. "'The tiger, whose nature teaches him to delight in shedding blood, "'needs but the sense of smell to show him "'when his prey is within his reach.' and by following this instinct he is enabled to measure the leap necessary to permit him to spring on his victim. But man, on the contrary, loathes the idea of blood. It is not alone that the laws of social life inspire him with the shrinking dread of taking life. His natural construction and physiological formation. Dantes was confused and silent at this explanation of the thoughts, which had unconsciously been working in his mind, or rather soul. For there are two distinct sorts of ideas, those that proceed from the head, and those that emanate from the heart. Since my imprisonment, said Faria, I have thought over all the most celebrated cases of escape on record. They have rarely been successful. Those that have been crowned with full success have been long meditated upon, and carefully arranged. Such, for instance, as the escape of the Duc de Buffon 
from the Chateau de Vincennes, that of the Abbey Dubuque, from Fort Levique, of Latude, from the Bastille. Then there are those for which chance sometimes affords opportunity, and those are the best of us. Let us, therefore, wait patiently for some favourable moment, and when it presents itself, profit by it. Ah, said Dantes, you might well endure the tedious delay. You were constantly employed in the task you set yourself, and when weary with toil, you had your hopes to refresh and encourage you. I assure you, replied the old man, I do not turn to that source for recreation or support. What did you do, then? I wrote or studied. Were you then permitted the use of pens, ink, and paper? Oh, no, answered the abbey. I had none but what I made for myself. You made paper, pens, and ink? Yes. Dantes gazed with admiration, but he had some difficulty in believing. Faria saw this. "'When you pay me a visit in my cell, my young friend,' said he, "'I will show you an entire work, "'the fruits of the thoughts and reflections of my whole life, "'many of them meditated over in the shades of the Colosseum at Rome, "'at the foot of St. Mark's Column at Venice, "'and on the borders of the Arno at Florence, "'little imagining at the time that they would be arranged in order "'within the walls of the Chateau d'Ilf. "'The work I speak of is called a treatise on the possibility of a general monarchy in Italy, and will make one large quarto volume. And on what have you written all this? On two of my shirts. I invented a preparation that makes lines as smooth and easy to write on as parchment. You are then a chemist? Somewhat. I know Laviosia, and was the intimate friend of Cabanus. "'But for such works you must have needed books. "'Had you any?' "'I had nearly five thousand in my library at Rome, "'but after reading them over many years, "'I found out that with one hundred and fifty well-chosen books "'a man possesses, if not a complete summary of all human knowledge, "'at least all that a man need really know. "'I devoted three years of my life to reading and studying "'these one hundred and fifty volumes.' till I knew them nearly by heart, so that since I have been in prison, a very slight effort of memory has enabled me to recall their contents as readily as though the pages were open before me. I could recite you the whole of Thucydides, Xenophon, Plutarch, Titus Livius, Tacitus, Strada, John Andes, Dante, Montaigne, Shakespeare, Spinoza, Machiavelli, and Bossiet. I name only the most important. You are doubtless acquainted with a variety of languages, so as to be able to read all these? Yes, I speak five of the modern tongues. That is to say, German, French, Italian, English, and Spanish. By the aid of ancient Greek, I learned modern Greek. I don't speak it so well as I could wish, but I am still trying to improve myself. "'Improve yourself?' repeated Dantes. "'Why, how can you manage to do so?' "'Why, I made a vocabulary of the words I knew, "'turned, returned, and arranged them, "'so as to enable me to express my thoughts through their medium. "'I know nearly one thousand words, "'which is all that is absolutely necessary, "'although I believe there are nearly one hundred thousand in the dictionaries. "'I cannot hope to be very fluent.' "'but I certainly should have no difficulty "'in explaining my wants and wishes. "'And that would be quite as much "'as I should ever require.' "'Stronger grew the wonder of Dantes, "'who almost fancied he had to do "'with one gifted with supernatural powers. "'Still hoping to find some imperfection "'which might bring him down to a level "'with human beings, he added, "'Then, if you were not furnished with pens, "'how did you manage to write the work "'which you speak of?' I made myself some excellent ones, which would be universally preferred to all others if once known. You are aware what huge whitings are served to us on meagre days. Well, I selected the cartilages of the heads of these fishes, and you can scarcely imagine the delight with which I welcome the arrival of each Wednesday, Friday, and Saturday, 
as affording me the means of increasing my stock of pens. For I will freely confess that my historical labours have been my greatest solace and relief. While retracing the past, I forget the present, and traversing at will the path of history, I cease to remember that I am myself a prisoner. But the ink, said Dantes, of what do you make your ink? There was formerly a fireplace in my dungeon, replied Farrier, but it was closed up long ere I became an occupant of this prison. Still, it must have been many years in use, for it was thickly covered with a coating of soot. This soot I dissolved in a portion of the wine brought to me every Sunday, and I assure you a better ink cannot be desired. For very important notes, for which closer attention is required, I pricked one of my fingers, and wrote with my own blood. "'And when?' asked Dantes. "'May I see all this?' "'Whenever you please.' "'replied the abbey. "'Oh, then let it be directly,' exclaimed the young man. "'Follow me, then,' said the abbey, "'as he re-entered the subterranean passage, "'in which he soon disappeared, followed by Dantes. "'End of chapter 16 "'This is a LibriVox recording. "'All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain.' For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Vicki Barber, St. John's, Newfoundland, February 2006. The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandra Dumas. Chapter 17. The Abbe's Chamber. After having passed with tolerable ease through the subterranean passage, which, however, did not admit of their holding themselves erect, the two friends reached the further end of the corridor, into which the abbe's cell opened. From that point the passage became much narrower, and barely permitted one to creep through on hands and knees. The floor of the abbe's cell was paved, and it had been by raising one of the stones in the most obscure corner that Faria had been able to commence the laborious task of which Dante's had witnessed the completion. As he entered the chamber of his friend, Dante's cast around one eager and searching glance in quest of the expected marvels, but nothing more than common met his view. "'It is well,' said the abbe. "'We have some hours before us. It is now just a quarter past twelve o'clock.' Instinctively Dante's turned round to observe by what watch or clock the abbe had been able so accurately to specify the hour. "'Look at this ray of light which enters by my window.' said the abbe, and then observed the lines traced on the wall. Well, by means of these lines, which are in accordance with the double motion of the earth, and the ellipse it describes round the sun, I am enabled to ascertain the precise hour with more minuteness than if I possessed a watch, for that might be broken or deranged in its movements, while the sun and earth never vary in their appointed paths." This last explanation was wholly lost upon Dante's, who had always imagined, from seeing the sun rise from behind the mountains and set in the Mediterranean, that it moved, and not the earth. A double movement of the globe he inhabited, and of which he could feel nothing, appeared to him perfectly impossible. Each word that fell from his companion's lips seemed fraught with the mysteries of science, as worthy of digging out as the gold and diamonds in the mines of Guzerat and Golconda which he could just recollect having visited during a voyage made in his earliest youth. "'Come,' he said to the abbe, "'I am anxious to see your treasures.' The abbe smiled, and proceeding to the disused fireplace, raised, by the help of his chisel, a long stone, which had doubtless been the hearth, beneath which was a cavity of considerable depth, serving as a safe depository of the articles mentioned to Dante's. "'What do you wish to see first? asked the abbe. "'Oh, your great work on the monarchy of Italy!' Faria then drew forth from his hiding-place three or four rolls of linen, laid one over the other, like folds of papyrus. These rolls consisted of slips of cloth, about four inches wide and eighteen long. They were all carefully numbered and closely covered with writing, so legible that Dante's could easily read it, as well as make out the sense, it being an Italian." a language he, as a Provencal, perfectly understood. There, he said, 
There is the work complete. I wrote the word fini at the end of the sixty-eighth strip about a week ago. I have torn up two of my shirts, and as many handkerchiefs as I was master of, to complete the precious pages. Should I ever get out of prison and find in all Italy a printer courageous enough to publish what I have composed, my literary reputation is forever secured. I see, answered Dante's. Now let me behold the curious pens with which you have written your work. Look, said Faria, showing to the young man a slender stick about six inches long and much resembling the size of the handle of a fine painting brush, to the end of which was tied by a piece of thread one of those cartilages of which the abbe had before spoken to Dante's. It was pointed and divided at the nib like an ordinary pen. Dante's examined it with intense admiration, then looked around to see the instrument with which it had been shaped so correctly into form. "'Ah, yes,' said Faria, "'the penknife. That's my masterpiece. I made it, as well as this larger knife, out of an old iron candlestick. The penknife was sharp and keen as a razor. As for the other knife, it would serve a double purpose, and with it one could cut and thrust.' Dantes examined the various articles shown to him with the same attention that he had bestowed on the curiosities and strange tools exhibited in the shops at Marseilles, as the works of the savages in the South Seas from whence they had been brought by the different trading vessels. "'As for the ink,' said Faria, "'I told you how I managed to obtain that, and I only just make it from time to time as I require it.' "'One thing still puzzles me,' observed Dantes. And that is how you manage to do all this by daylight. I worked at night also, replied Faria. Night? Why, for heaven's sake, are your eyes like cats that you can see to work in the dark? Indeed they are not. But God has supplied man with the intelligence that enables him to overcome the limitations of natural conditions. I furnished myself with a light. You did? Pray tell me how. I separated the fat from the meat served to me, melted it, and so made oil. Here is my lamp. So saying, the abbe exhibited a sort of torch, very similar to those used in public illuminations. But light? Here are two flints and a piece of burnt linen. And matches? I pretended that I had a disorder of the skin, and asked for a little sulfur, which was readily supplied. Dantes laid the different things he had been looking at on the table, and stood with his head drooping on his breast, as though overwhelmed by the perseverance and strength of Faria's mind. "'You have not seen all yet,' continued Faria, "'for I did not think it wise to trust all my treasures in the same hiding-place. Let us shut this one up.' They put the stone back in its place. The abbe sprinkled a little dust over it to conceal the traces of it having been removed, rubbed his foot well on it to make it assume the same appearance as the other, and then, going towards his bed, he removed it from the spot it stood in. Behind the head of the bed, and concealed by a stone fitting in so closely as to defy all suspicion, was a hollow space, and in this space a ladder of cords between twenty-five and thirty feet in length. Dantes closely and eagerly examined it. He found it firm, solid, and compact enough to bear any weight. Who supplied you with the materials for making this wonderful work? I tore up several of my shirts and ripped out the seams in the sheets of my bed during my three years' imprisonment at Fenestrelle, and when I was removed to the Chateau d'If, I managed to bring the ravelings with me so that I have been able to finish my work here. And was it not discovered that your sheets were unhemmed? Oh, no, for when I had taken out the thread I required, I hemmed the edges over again. With what? With this needle, said the abbe. As opening his ragged vestments, he showed Dante's a long, sharp fishbone, with a small perforated eye for the thread, a small portion of which still remained in it. I once thought, continued Faria, of removing these iron bars and letting myself down from the window which, as you see, is somewhat wider than yours, although I should have enlarged it still more preparatory to my flight. However, I discovered that I should merely have dropped into a sort of inner court, and I therefore renounced the project altogether as too full of risk and danger. 
Nevertheless, I carefully preserved my ladder against one of those unforeseen opportunities of which I just spoke, and which sudden chance frequently brings about. While affecting to be deeply engaged in examining the ladder, the mind of Dante's was, in fact, busily occupied by the idea that a person so intelligent, ingenious, and clear-sighted as the Abbe might probably be able to solve the dark mystery of his own misfortunes, where he himself could see nothing. "'What are you thinking of?' asked the Abbe, smilingly, inputting the deep abstraction in which his visitor was plunged to the excess of his awe and wonder. "'I was reflecting, in the first place,' replied Dantes, "'upon the enormous degree of intelligence and ability you must have employed to reach the high perfection to which you have attained. What would you not have accomplished if you had been free?' "'Possibly nothing at all. The overflow of my brain would probably, in a state of freedom, have evaporated in a thousand follies. Misfortune is needed to bring to light the treasures of the human intellect. Compression is needed to explode gunpowder. Captivity has brought my mental faculties to a focus, and you are well aware that from the collision of clouds electricity is produced. From electricity, lightning. From lightning, illumination. No, replied Dantes, I know nothing. Some of your words are to me quite empty of meaning. You must be blessed indeed to possess the knowledge you have. The abbe smiled. Well, said he, but you had another subject for your thoughts. Did you not say so just now? I did. You have told me, as yet, but one of them. Let me hear the other. It was this, that while you had related to me all the particulars of your past life, you were perfectly unacquainted with mine. Your life, my young friend, has not been of sufficient length to admit of your having passed through any very important events. It has been long enough to inflict on me a great and undeserved misfortune. I would fain fix the source of it on man, that I may no longer vent reproaches upon heaven. Then you profess ignorance of the crime with which you are charged. I do indeed, and this I swear by the two beings most dear to me upon the earth, my father and Mercedes. Come, said the abbe, closing his hiding place and pushing the bed back to its original situation. Let me hear your story. Dantes obeyed and commenced what he called his history, but which consisted only of the account of the voyage to India and two or three voyages to the Levant until he arrived at the recital of his last cruise with the death of Captain Leclerc, and the receipt of a packet to be delivered by himself to the Grand Marshal. His interview with that personage, and his receiving, in place of the packet, brought a letter addressed to a Monsieur Nortier, his arrival at Marseilles, and interview with his father, his affection for Mercedes in their nuptial feast, his arrest and subsequent examination, his temporary detention at the Palais de Justice, and his final imprisonment in the Chateau d'If. From this point everything was a blank to Dantes. He knew nothing more, not even the length of time he had been imprisoned. His recital finished, the abbe reflected long and earnestly. There is, said he, at the end of his meditations, a clever maxim which bears upon what I was saying to you some little while ago, and that is that unless wicked ideas take root in a naturally depraved mind, human nature, in a right and wholesome state, revolts at crime. Still, from an artificial civilization have originated wants, vices, and false tastes, which occasionally become so powerful as to stifle within us all good feelings, and ultimately to lead us into guilt and wickedness. From this view of things, then, comes the axiom that if you visit to discover the author of any bad action, seek first to discover the person to whom the perpetration of that bad action could be in any way advantageous. Now, to apply it in your case, to whom could your disappearance have been serviceable? To no one by heaven. I was a very insignificant person. Do not speak thus, for your reply invinces neither logic nor philosophy. Everything is relative, my dear young friend, from the king who stands in the way of his successor to the employee who keeps his rival out of a place. Now, in the event of the king's death, his successor inherits a crown. 
When the employee dies, the supernumerary steps into his shoes and receives his salary of twelve thousand livres. Well, these twelve thousand livres are his civil list, and are as essential to him as the twelve millions of a king. Every one, from the highest to the lowest degree, has his place on the social ladder, and is beset by stormy passions and conflicting interests, as in Descartes' theory of pressure and impulsion. But these forces increase as we go higher, so that we have a spiral which in defiance of reason rests upon the apex and not on the base. Now, let us return to your particular world. You say you were on the point of being made captain of the pharaon. Yes. And about to become the husband of a young and lovely girl. Yes. Now, could any one have had any interest in preventing the accomplishment of these two things? But let us first settle the question as to its being the interest of any one to hinder you from being captain of the pharaon. What say you? I cannot believe such was the case. I was generally liked on board, and had the sailors possessed the right of selecting a captain themselves, I feel convinced their choice would have fallen on me. There was only one person among the crew who had any feeling of ill will towards me. I had quarrelled with him some time previously, and had even challenged him to fight me, but he refused. Now we are getting on, and what was this man's name? Danglars. What rank did he hold on board? He was supercargo. And had you been captain, should you have retained him in his employment? Not if the choice had remained with me, for I had frequently observed inaccuracies in his accounts. Good again. Now then, tell me, was any person present during your last conversation with Captain Leclerc? No, we were quite alone. Could your conversation have been overheard by anyone? It might, for the cabin door was open, and— Stay, now I recollect. Danglars himself passed by just as Captain Leclerc was giving me the packet for the Grand Marshal. That's better, cried the abbe. Now we are on the right scent. Did you take anybody with you when you put into the port of Elba? Nobody. Somebody there received your packet, and gave you a letter in place of it, I think. Yes, the Grand Marshal did. And what did you do with that letter? Put it into my portfolio. You had your portfolio with you, then. Now, how could a sailor find room in his pocket for a portfolio large enough to contain an official letter? You are right. It was left on board. Then it was not till your return to the ship that you put the letter in the portfolio. No. And what did you do with this same letter while returning from Porto Fierro to the vessel? I carried it in my hand, so that when you went on board the pharaon, everybody could see that you held a letter in your hand? Yes. Danglars as well as the rest? Danglars as well as others. Now listen to me, and try to recall every circumstance attending your arrest. Do you recollect the words in which the information against you was formulated? Oh, yes, I read it over three times, and the words sank deeply into my memory. Repeat it to me. Dante's paused a moment, then said, This is it, word for word. The king's attorney is informed by a friend to the throne and religion that one Edmund Dante's, mate on board the pharaon, this day arrived from Samara, after having touched at Naples and Porto Fierro has been entrusted by Murat with a packet for the usurper, again by the usurper, with a letter for the Bonapartist Club in Paris. This proof of his guilt may be procured by his immediate arrest, as the letter will be found either about his person, at his father's residence, or in his cabin on board the Pharaon. The abbe shrugged his shoulders. The thing is clear as day, said he, and you must have had a very confiding nature as well as a good heart, not to have suspected the origin of the whole affair. Do you really think so? Ah, oh, that would indeed be infamous. How did Danglars usually write? Oh, in a handsome running hand. And how was the anonymous letter written? Backhanded. Again, the abbe smiled. Disguised? It was very boldly written, if disguised. 
stop a bit, said the abbe, taking up what he called his pen, and after dipping it into the ink, he wrote on a piece of prepared linen, with his left hand, the first two or three words of the accusation. Dantes drew back and gazed on the abbe with a sensation almost amounting to terror. How very astonishing, cried he at length. Why, your writing exactly resembles that of the accusation. Simply because that accusation had been written with the left hand, and I have noticed that— What? That while the writing of different persons done with the right hand varies, that performed with the left hand is invariably uniform. You have evidently seen and observed everything. Oh, let us proceed. Oh, yes, yes. Now, as regards the second question— I'm listening. Was there any person whose interest it was to prevent your marriage with Mercedes? Yes, a young man who loved her. And his name was? Fernand. That is the Spanish name, I think. He was a Catalan. You imagine him capable of writing the letter? Oh, no. He would more likely have got rid of me by sticking a knife into me. That is in strict accordance with the Spanish character, an assassination they will unhesitatingly commit, but an act of cowardice? Never. Besides, said Dantes, the various circumstances mentioned in the letter were wholly unknown to him. You had never spoken of them yourself to anyone? To no one. Not even to your mistress? No, not even to my betrothed. Then it is Danglars. I feel quite sure of it now. Wait a little. Pray. Was Danglars acquainted with Fernand? No. Yes, he was. Now I recollect. What? To have seen them both sitting at table together under an arbor at Père Pamphys the evening before the day fixed for my wedding. They were in earnest conversation. Danglars was joking in a friendly way, but Fernand looked pale and agitated. Were they alone? There was a third person with them whom I knew perfectly well and who had, in all probability, made their acquaintance. He was a tailor named Caderousse, but he was very drunk. Stay! Stay! How strange that it should not have occurred to me before! Now I remember quite well that on the table round which they were sitting were pens, ink, and paper. Oh, the heartless, treacherous scoundrels! exclaimed Dantes, pressing his hand to his throbbing brows. Is there anything else I can assist you in discovering, besides the villainy of your friends? inquired the abbe with a laugh. Yes, yes, replied Dantes eagerly. I would beg of you, who see so completely to the depth of things, and to whom the greatest mystery seems but an easy riddle, to explain to me how it was that I underwent no second examination, was never brought to trial, and above all, was condemned without ever having had sentence passed on me. That is altogether a different and more serious matter, responded the abbe. The ways of justice are frequently too dark and mysterious to be easily penetrated. All we have hitherto done in the matter has been child's play. If you wish me to enter upon the more difficult part of the business, you must assist me by the most minute information on every point." Pray ask me whatever questions you please, for in good truth you see more clearly into my life than I do myself. In the first place, then, who examined you? The king's attorney, his deputy, or a magistrate? The deputy. Was he young or old? About six or seven and twenty years of age, I should say. So, answered the abbe, old enough to be ambitious— but too young to be corrupt. And how did he treat you? With more of mildness than severity. Did you tell him your whole story? I did. And did his conduct change at all in the course of your examination? He did appear much disturbed when he read the letter that had brought me into this scrape. He seemed quite overcome by my misfortune. By your misfortune? Yes. "'Then you feel quite sure that it was your misfortune he deplored. "'He gave me one great proof of his sympathy at any rate. "'And that? "'He burnt the sole evidence that could have at all incriminated me. "'What, the accusation? "'No, the letter. "'Are you sure? "'I saw it done. "'That alters the case. 
This man might, after all, be a greater scoundrel than you have thought possible. Upon my word, said Dantes, you make me shudder. Is the world filled with tigers and crocodiles? Yes, and remember that two-legged tigers and crocodiles are more dangerous than the others. Never mind, let us go on. With all my heart, you tell me he burned the letter? He did, saying at the same time, you see, I thus destroy the only proof existing against you. This action is somewhat too sublime to be natural. You think so? I am sure of it. To whom was this letter addressed? To Monsieur Nortier, number 13, Coq Heron, Paris. Now, can you conceive of any interest that your heroic deputy could possibly have had in the destruction of that letter? Why... It is not altogether impossible. He might have had, for he made me promise several times never to speak of that letter to anyone, assuring me he so advised me for my own interest. And more than this, he insisted on my taking a solemn oath never to utter the name mentioned in the address. Noirtier, repeated the abbe, Noirtier. I knew a person of that name at the Count of the Queen of Etrunia, a Noirtier, who had been a Garondin during the Revolution. What was your deputy called? De Villefort. The abbe burst into a fit of laughter, while Dantes gazed on him in utter astonishment. What ails you? he said at length. Do you see that ray of sunlight? I do. Well, the whole thing is more clear to me than that sunbeam is to you. Poor fellow! You poor young man, and you tell me this magistrate expressed great sympathy and commiseration for you? He did. And the worthy man destroyed your compromising letter? Yes. Why, you poor, short-sighted simpleton, can you not guess who this Noirtier was, whose very name he was so careful to keep concealed? Noirtier was his father. Had a thunderbolt fallen at the feet of Dante's, or hell opened its yawning gulf before him, he could not have been more completely transfixed with horror than he was at the sound of these unexpected words. Starting up, he clasped his hands around his head as though to prevent his very brain from bursting, and exclaimed, "'His father! His father!' "'Yes, his father,' replied the abbe. His right name was Noir Thierre de Villefort. At this instant a bright light shot through the mind of Dantes, and cleared up all that had been dark and obscure before. The change that had come over Villefort during the examination, the destruction of the letter, the exacted promise, the almost supplicating tones of the magistrate, who seemed rather to implore mercy than to pronounce punishment, all returned with a stunning force to his memory. He cried out, and staggered against the wall like a drunken man. Then he hurried to the opening that led from the abbe's cell to his own, and said, I must be alone, to think over all this. When he regained his dungeon, he threw himself on his bed, where the turnkey found him in the evening visit, sitting with fixed gaze and contracted features, dumb and motionless as a statue. During these hours of profound meditation— which to him had seemed only minutes, he had formed a fearful resolution, and bound himself to its fulfillment by a solemn oath. Dante's was at length roused from his reverie by the voice of Faria, who, having also been visited by his jailer, had come to invite his fellow sufferer to share his supper. The reputation of being out of his mind, though harmlessly, and even amusingly so, had procured for the abbe unusual privileges. He was supplied with bread of a finer, whiter quality than the usual prison fare, and even regaled each Sunday with a small quantity of wine. Now this was a Sunday, and the abbe had come to ask his young companion to share the luxuries with him. Dante's followed. His features were no longer contracted, and now wore their usual expression. But there was that in his whole appearance that bespoke one who had come to a fixed and desperate resolve. Faria bent on him his penetrating eye. "'I regret now,' said he, "'having helped you in your late inquiries, "'or having given you the information I did.' "'Why so?' inquired Dantes. 
because it has instilled a new passion in your heart, that of vengeance. Dante smiled. Let us talk of something else, said he. Again the abbe looked at him, then mournfully shook his head, but in an accordance with Dante's request he began to speak of other matters. The elder prisoner was one of those persons whose conversation, like that of all who have experienced many trials, contained many useful and important hints, as well as sound information. But it was never egotistical, for the unfortunate man never alluded to his own sorrows. Dante's listened with admiring attention to all he said. Some of his remarks corresponded with what he already knew, or applied to the sort of knowledge his nautical life had enabled him to acquire. A part of the good abbe's words, however, were wholly incomprehensible to him. But, like the aurora which guides the navigator in northern latitudes, opened new vistas to the inquiring mind of the listener, and gave fantastic glimpses of new horizons, enabling him, justly, to estimate the delight an intellectual mind would have in following one so richly gifted as Faria along the heights of truth, where he was so much at home. "'You must teach me a small part of what you know,' said Dantes, "'if only to prevent your growing weary of me. "'I can well believe that so learned a person as yourself "'would prefer absolute solitude "'to being tormented with the company of one as ignorant and uninformed as myself. "'If you will only agree to my request, "'I promise you never to mention another word about escaping.' "'The abbe smiled. "'Alas, my boy,' said he, Human knowledge is confined within very narrow limits, and when I have taught you mathematics, physics, history, and the three or four modern languages with which I am acquainted, you will know as much as I do myself. Now, it will scarcely require two years for me to communicate to you the stock of learning I possess. Two years? exclaimed Dantes. Do you really believe I can acquire all these things in so short a time? Not their applications, certainly, but their principles, you may. To learn is not to know. There are the learners and the learned. Memory makes the one, philosophy the other. But cannot one learn philosophy? Philosophy cannot be taught. It is the application of the sciences to truth. It is like the golden cloud in which the Messiah went up to heaven. Well, then, said Dante's. What shall you teach me first? I am in a hurry to begin. I want to learn. Everything, said the abbe. And that very evening, the prisoner sketched a plan of education to be entered upon the following day. Dante's possessed a prestigious memory, combined with an astonishing quickness and readiness of conception. The mathematical turn of his mind rendered him apt at all kinds of calculation while his naturally poetical feelings throw a light and pleasing veil over the dry reality of arithmetical computation, or the rigid severity of geometry. He already knew Italian, and had also picked up a little of the Romantic dialect during voyages to the East, and by the aid of these two languages he easily comprehended the construction of all the others, so that at the end of six months he began to speak Spanish, English, and German. In strict accordance with the promise made to the abbe, Dantes spoke no more of escape. Perhaps the delight his studies afforded him left no room for such thoughts. Perhaps the recollection that he had pledged his word, on which his sense of honor was keen, kept him from referring in any way to the possibilities of flight. Days, even months, passed by unheeded in one rapid and instructive course. At the end of a year, Dantes was a new man. Dante's observed, however, that Faria, in spite of the relief his society afforded, daily grew sadder. One thought seemed incessantly to harass and distract his mind. Sometimes he would fall into long reveries, sigh heavily and involuntarily, then suddenly rise, and with folded arms, began pacing the confined space of his dungeon. One day he stopped all at once and exclaimed, "Ah!" Oh, if there were no sentinel, there shall not be one a minute longer than you please, said Dantes, who had followed the workings of his thoughts as accurately as though his brain were enclosed in crystal, so clear as to display its minutest operation. I have already told you, answered the abbe, 
that I loathe the idea of shedding blood. And yet the murder, if you choose to call it so, would be simply a measure of self-preservation. No matter, I could never agree to it. Still, you have thought of it. Incessantly, alas, cried the abbe, and you have discovered a means of regaining our freedom, have you not? asked Dantes eagerly. I have. If it were only possible to place a deaf and blind sentinel in the gallery beyond us. He shall be both blind and deaf, replied the young man, with an air of determination that made his companion shudder. No, no, cried the abbe, impossible. Dante's endeavoured to renew the subject. The abbe shook his head, in token of disapproval, and refused to make any further response. Three months passed away. "'Are you strong?' the abbe asked one day of Dante's. The young man, in reply, took up the chisel, bent it into the form of a horseshoe, and then as readily straightened it. "'And will you engage not to do any harm to the sentry?' except as a last resort? I promise on my honor. Then, said the abbe, we may hope to put our design into execution. And how long shall we be in accomplishing the necessary work? At least a year. And shall we begin at once? At once. We have lost a year to no purpose, cried Dantes. Do you consider the last twelve months to have been wasted? asked the abbe. Forgive me cried Edmund, blushing deeply. "'Tut, tut,' answered the abbe. "'Man is but man after all, and you are about the best specimen of the genus I have ever known. Come, let me show you my plan.' The abbe then showed Dante's the sketch he had made for their escape. It consisted of a plan of his own cell and that of Dante's, with the passage which united them. In this passage he proposed to drive a level, as they do in mines. This level would bring the two prisoners immediately beneath the gallery, where the sentry kept watch. Once there, a large excavation would be made, and one of the flagstones with which the gallery was paved be so completely loosened that at the desired moment it would give way beneath the feet of the soldier, who, stunned by his fall, would be immediately bound and gagged by Dante's before he had power to offer any resistance. The prisoners were then to make their way through one of the gallery windows, and to let themselves down from the outer walls by means of the abbe's ladder of cords. Dante's eyes sparkled with joy, and he rubbed his hands with delight at the idea of a plan so simple, yet apparently so certain to succeed. That very day the miners began their labors, with a vigor and altruity proportionate to their long rest from fatigue and their hopes of ultimate success. Nothing interrupted the progress of the work except the necessity that each was under of returning to his cell in anticipation of the turnkey's visit. They had learned to distinguish the almost imperceptible sound of his footsteps as he descended towards their dungeons, and happily never failed of being prepared for his coming. The fresh earth excavated during their present work, and which would have entirely blocked up the old passage, was thrown, by degrees and with the utmost precaution, out of the window, in either Faria's or Dante's cell, the rubbish being first pulverized so finely that the night wind carried it far away without permitting the smallest trace to remain. More than a year had been consumed in this undertaking, the only tools for which had been a chisel, a knife, and a wooden lever. Faria, still continuing to instruct Dante's by conversing with him, sometimes in one language, sometimes in another, at others, relating to him the history of nations and great men who from time to time have risen to fame and trodden the path of glory. The abbe was a man of the world, and had moreover mixed in the first society of the day. He wore an air of melancholy dignity, which Dante's, thanks to the imitative powers bestowed on him by nature, easily acquired, as well as that outward polish and politeness he had before been wanting in, and which is seldom possessed except by those who have been placed in constant intercourse with persons of high birth and breeding. At the end of fifteen months the level was finished, and the excavation completed beneath the gallery. 
and the two workmen could distinctly hear the measured tread of the sentinel as he paced to and fro over their heads. Compelled as they were to await a night sufficiently dark to favor their flight, they were obliged to defer their final attempt till that auspicious moment should arrive. Their greatest dread now was lest the stone through which the sentry was doomed to fall should give way before its right time, and this they had in some measure provided against by propping it up with a small beam which they had discovered in the walls through which they had worked their way. Dante's was occupied in arranging this piece of wood when he heard Faria, who had remained in Edmund's cell for the purpose of cutting a peg to secure their rope ladder, call to him in a tone indicative of great suffering. Dante's hastened to his dungeon, where he found him standing in the middle of the room, pale as death, his forehead streaming with perspiration, and his hands clenched tightly together. "'Gracious heavens!' exclaimed Dante. "'What is the matter? What has happened?' "'Quick, quick,' returned the abbe. "'Listen to what I have to say.' Dante's looked in fear, and wonder at the livid countenance of Faria, whose eyes— already dull and sunken, were surrounded by purple circles, while his lips were white as those of a corpse, and his very hair seemed to stand on end. "'Tell me, I beseech you, what ails you?' cried Dantes, letting his chisel fall to the floor. "'Alas!' faltered out the abbe. "'All is over with me. I am seized with a terrible, perhaps mortal, illness. I can feel that the paroxysm is fast approaching.' I had a similar attack the year previous to my imprisonment. This malady admits but of one remedy. I will tell you what that is. Go into my cell as quickly as you can. Draw out one of the feet that support the bed. You will find it has been hollowed out for the purpose of containing a small file. You will see they are half filled with a red-looking fluid. Bring it to me. Or rather, no, no. I may be found here, therefore— Help me back to my room while I have the strength to drag myself along. Who knows what may happen, or how long the attack may last. In spite of the magnitude of the misfortune which thus suddenly frustrated his hopes, Dante's did not lose his presence of mind, but descended into the passage, dragging his unfortunate companion with him. Then, half carrying, half supporting him, he managed to reach the abbe's chamber, when he immediately laid the sufferer on his bed. "'Thanks,' said the poor Abbe, shivering as though his veins were filled with ice. "'I am about to be seized with a feat of catalepsy. When it comes to its height, I shall probably lie still and motionless, as though dead, uttering neither sigh nor groan. On the other hand, the symptoms may be much more violent, and cause me to fall into fearful convulsions, foam at the mouth, and cry out loudly.' Take care my cries are not heard, for if they are, it is more than probable I should be removed to another part of the prison, and we be separated for ever. When I become quite motionless, cold, and rigid as a corpse, then, and not before, be careful about this, force open my teeth with a knife, pour from eight to ten drops of the liquor contained in the phial down my throat, and I may perhaps revive. Perhaps? exclaimed Dante's in grief-stricken tones. "'Help! help!' cried the abbe. "'I... I... die!' So sudden and violent was the fit that the unfortunate prisoner was unable to complete the sentence. A violent convulsion shook his whole frame. His eyes stared from their sockets, his mouth was drawn on one side, his cheeks became purple. He struggled, foamed, dashed himself about, and uttered the most dreadful cries, which, however, Dante's prevented from being heard by covering his head with the blanket. The fit lasted two hours. Then, more helpless than an infant, and colder and paler than marble, more crushed and broken than a reed trampled underfoot, he fell back, doubled up in one last convulsion, and became as rigid as a corpse. Edmund waited till life seemed extinct in the body of his friend. Then, taking up the knife, he with difficulty forced open the closely fixed jaws, carefully administered the appointed number of drops, and anxiously awaited the result. An hour passed away, 
and the old man gave no sign of returning animation. Dantes began to fear he had delayed too long ere he administered the remedy, and thrusting his hands into his hair, continued gazing on the lifeless features of his friend. At length a slight color tinged the livid cheeks. Consciousness returned to the dull open eyeballs, a faint sigh issued from the lips, and the sufferer made a feeble effort to move. "'He is saved! He is saved!' cried Dantes in a paroxysm of delight. The sick man was not yet able to speak, but he pointed with evident anxiety towards the door. Dantes listened, and plainly distinguished the approaching steps of the jailer. It was therefore near seven o'clock, but Edmund's anxiety had put all thoughts of time out of his head. The young man sprang to the entrance, darted through it, carefully drawing the stone over the opening, and hurried to his cell. He had scarcely done so before the door opened and the jailer saw the prisoner seated as usual on the side of his bed. Almost before the key had turned in the lock, and before the departing steps of the jailer had died away in the long corridor he had to traverse, Dantes, whose restless anxiety concerning his friend left him no desire to touch the food brought him, hurried back to the abbe's chamber, and raising the stone by pressing his head against it, was soon beside the sick man's couch. Faria had now fully regained his consciousness, but he still lay helpless and exhausted. "'I did not expect to see you again,' he said feebly to Dantes. "'And why not?' asked the young man. "'Did you fancy yourself dying?' "'No, I had no such idea. But knowing that all was ready for flight, I thought you might have made your escape.' The deep glow of indignation suffused the cheeks of Dantes. "'Without you? Did you really think me capable of that?' "'At least,' said the abbe, "'I now see how wrong such an opinion would have been. "'Alas, alas, I am fearfully exhausted and debilitated by this attack.' "'Be of good cheer,' replied Dantes. "'Your strength will return.' And as he spoke, he seated himself near the bed besides Faria, and took his hands. The abbe shook his head. The last attack I had, said he, lasted but half an hour, and after it I was hungry, and got up without help. Now I can move neither my right arm nor leg, and my head seems uncomfortable, which shows that there has been a suffusion of blood on the brain. The third attack will either carry me off or leave me paralyzed for life. No, cried Dantes, you are mistaken. You will not die and your third attack, if indeed you should have another, will find you at liberty. We shall save you another time, as we have done this, only with a better chance of success, because we shall be able to command every requisite assistance. My good Edmund, answered the abbe, be not deceived. The attack, which has just passed away, condemns me for ever to the walls of a prison. None can fly from a dungeon who cannot walk." Well, we will wait, a week, a month, two months, if need be, and meanwhile your strength will return. Everything is in readiness for our flight, and we can select any time we choose. As soon as you feel able to swim, we will go. I shall never swim again, replied Faria. This arm is paralyzed, not for a time, but for ever. Lift it, and judge if I am mistaken. The young man raised the arm which fell back by its own weight, perfectly inanimate and helpless. A sigh escaped him. "'You are convinced now, Edmund, are you not?' asked the abbe. "'Depend upon it. I know what I say. Since the first attack I experienced of this malady, I have continually reflected on it. Indeed, I expected it, for it is a family inheritance. Both my father and grandfather died of it in a third attack. The physician who prepared for me the remedy I have twice successfully taken was no other than the celebrated Cabanus, and he predicted a similar end for me. The physician may be mistaken, exclaimed Dantes, and as for your poor arm, what difference will that make? I can take you on my shoulders and swim for both of us. My son, said the abbe, you who are a sailor and a swimmer, must know as well as I do that a man so loaded would sink before he had done fifty strokes. 
Cease, then, to allow yourself to be duped by vain hopes that even your own excellent heart refuses to believe in. Here I shall remain till the hour of my deliverance arrives, and that, in all human probability, will be the hour of my death. As for you, who are young and active, delay not on my account, but fly, go, I give you back your promise. It is well, said Dantes, then I shall also remain. Then, rising and extending his hand with an air of solemnity over the old man's head, he slowly added, By the blood of Christ, I swear never to leave you while you live. Faria gazed fondly on his noble-minded, single-hearted, high-principled young friend, and read in his countenance ample confirmation of the sincerity of his devotion and the loyalty of his purpose. "'Thanks,' murmured the invalid, extending one hand. "'I accept. You may one of these days reap the reward of your disinterested devotion, but as I cannot, and you will not, quit this place, it becomes necessary to fill up the excavation beneath the soldier's gallery. He might, by chance, hear the hollow sound of his footsteps, and call the attention of his officer to the circumstance. That would bring about a discovery which would inevitably lead to our being separated. Go, then, and set about this work, in which, unhappily, I can offer you no assistance. Keep at it all night, if necessary, and do not return here to-morrow, till after the jailer has visited me. I shall have something of the greatest importance to communicate to you. Dantes took the hand of the abbe in his, and affectionately pressed it. Faria smiled encouragingly on him, and the young man retired to his task, in the spirit of obedience and respect which he had sworn to show towards his aged friend. End of chapter 17